Now, I have little doubt that if you've got this far in your studies in science and biology in particular, you've probably compared an animal cell to a plant cell before. And you probably remember some sort of representation of a plant cell it might look a little bit like this. So you might recognize this large central vacuole, which is characteristic of many plant cells. We have the green chloroplast, of course responsible for photosynthesis. We have a cell wall that, unlike fungi and bacteria, is composed of the structural carbohydrate cellulose. And, of course, you will notice that we have a membrane-enclosed nucleus, which makes sense given that these organisms are part of the eukarya domain. And in addition to these components of the cell, we know that plants as a whole are primarily autotrophic, that is, they obtain their energy from inorganic sources like the sun. We know that plants lack structures for locomotion, they don't move around very much, but they do orient themselves in such a way to maximize their exposure to the source of light. So, we do have some plants that develop specialized structures like tendrils that will allow them to move up material, think about ivy, in order to acquire or position themselves in a better way to be exposed to the most sunlight. We also have this phenomenon referred to as phototropism, where these chemical compounds called auxins allow the plant to orient itself in such a way that it will appear as if the plant is turning or moving towards the source of the sun. And speaking of light, we know that plants take that inorganic source of energy, the sun's light, and convert it into a form of energy that can be stored. We refer to this storage carbohydrate as starch. And it's just a massive macromolecule made up of individual glucose units. And these glucose units are formed from the sun's energy through the process of photosynthesis. So obviously being autotrophic, being able to take an inorganic source of energy and convert it into a usable form, they're extremely important as producers, especially in terrestrial food webs. And as a result, they're massively important as a food source, either directly by eating them or by eating the things that eat them. And not only that, if we think about massive length of geological cycles, the plants that existed many, many years ago and other organic matter that is decomposed and being compressed into crude oil now serves as fuel sources for our automobiles and our planes. And not only that, we can refine it and convert it into petroleum, which then can be converted into other products and plastics and so on and so forth. And that's not even to discuss the other materials that come directly from plants, like wood or paper products or cotton or medicines. So they are massively important. And not only that, they're important for our well-being as well. We enjoy taking a walk through the woods and we enjoy tending our gardens. They are something that we give to others as a result of a celebration or in memoriam of a life well lived. So when we think about these plants, they have direct and indirect importance to us and other living things on this planet. Now, the purpose of this video is not to make you a botanist or a horticulturalist or a vegetarian or even an above average gardener. Rather, the purpose of this is to help us try to identify some of the characteristics that allow us to categorize and organize these plants. But I think one of the best ways to think about plants, especially when we're talking about terrestrial plants, plants on Earth, is to think about the development or evolution of these plants by looking at something like a parking lot. Now, when you first think about a parking lot, you probably don't think about plants. In fact, you probably think about the absence of plants. But most of the time, if you think about a parking lot or a driveway or a sidewalk or a basketball court or a tennis court, we spend a lot of our time trying to prevent plants from getting a foothold. You see, if we leave a parking lot long enough, it could look like this. And what we're going to notice is that tiny plants start to form eventually in the cracks. You see, there's enough dirt and debris and organic matter breaking down that eventually there's some good enough soil that something is going to start to grow. And these are typically tiny plants, but then those tiny plants get in there and they die and decompose and they start to enrich the soil and eventually we start to get larger plants. And eventually the same process goes on and on and on and after many years we can start to see that, well, that doesn't really look like a parking lot anymore, it starts to look like a grassland or a field. And if we left it even longer, it would start to develop into a forest. And if we left it even longer, it would be a mature forest. We refer to this process as succession. And more specifically, when we talk about something like a parking lot or when we talk about a tennis court, we refer to this as secondary succession. Now, in order for plants to live on land, they have to overcome certain barriers. 
You see, when they're in the water, that's great because plants require water, we know this, but part of the downfall of being in the water is the lack of exposure to direct sunlight. So there are absolutely benefits for plants being terrestrial, being on land, but obviously there are challenges as well. When we leave the water, there is a real challenge of water loss. And so as a result, plants have had to deal with this by developing a waxy coating that we refer to as a cuticle. And this cuticle prevents or reduces water loss. In addition, plants have to be able to exchange gases with the environment. So they've developed structures that we refer to as stoma or stomata, and these allow and regulate gases into and out of the plant. And the first such type, the simplest type of plants that we see with these types of structures are the mosses. We refer to these as the bryophytes. And these bryophytes are extremely simple. They lack transport systems. They have specialized cells, but they lack transport systems. They don't have root systems or stems or proper leaves that we see in other types of plants. But they are terrestrial photosynthesizing producers, and they are one of the first types of organisms that you are going to see when the process of succession occurs. Now, the challenge that these plants face is that they have to be near water. That is, you're going to see these types of plants, the mosses, in very damp environments because their reproduction relies on the sperm being able to move through water. So in order for these plants to become more developed and more evolved, they have to start developing specialized structures so that they can draw water from one place and move it up into other structures. And as we move into the next grouping of plants, the tracheophytes, the vascularized plants, we start to see some of these structures emerge. So the next group of plants that we're going to look at are the pteridophytes. So they are a subgrouping of the tracheophytes of the vascular plants, and we refer to these more commonly as the ferns. And what we're going to notice with the ferns is they, they start to have some specialized transport structures. And as a result of these transport structures, they're able to specialize even further. And this is where we start to see root systems occur. And this is where we start to see leaves and stems. And so as a result of all of these transport structures, we can get water now from these root systems up into the stems and up into the leaves. So we can start to transport some of these materials that are being taken in from the root system in the ground to the places in the plant where we need them. And as a result, we start to see more robust, larger structures of these plants. But some of the challenges these plants still face is that they have to be found near a source of water or in very wet environments because they still, like the bryophytes, require water in order to reproduce. So now as we increase the complexity of these plants, we are starting to get into plants that can move further afield from a source of water. That is, they can reproduce without water being present. We refer to these as the seed producing plants. And we can further subdivide these seed producing plants into the gymnosperms, which are the plants that we most associate with the cone bearing plants, the conifers, the evergreens. And then we have the angiosperms, which are the ones that we would associate with flowers, the flowering plants. And if we take a look at these gymnosperms, the conifers, the evergreens, the Christmas trees, these are the ones that we characterize as having naked seeds. The seeds are not enclosed. They are found in the pine cones and quite often they are spread by wind or by uh, water, by gravity. And when we think about the characteristics of these types of plants, they quite often have very narrow leaves. They have a thick waxy cuticle and that allows the leaves to be found year round so they can be drought tolerant and they can be uh, cold tolerant. We know that these long thin uh, leaves allow for there to kind of be a barrier where there's a dead wind space that re reduces the amount of evaporation that goes on. We know that they have very fibrous and primarily pretty shallow root systems. So they do live for the most part in very sort of damp environments and these shallow root systems allows them to capture a lot of the surface rainwater. So despite the very impressive age and size that some of these gymnosperms have been able to accomplish, the limitations of distribution and survival of naked seeds has led to an even more successful group of plants that we refer to as the angiosperms or flowering plants. And their enclosed seeds 
has resulted in a group of plants that, at least as far as we have categorized, make up over 90% of the world's plant species. Now, there may be some of you out there that suffer from allergies, and we think about allergies and flowering plants, you're probably going to associate it with this stuff. That's right, it's pollen. Now, pollen is a haploid gamete that will, in some way, shape, or form, make its way to another plant and eventually fertilize that plant so that it forms a diploid zygote, and that zygote will eventually develop and grow into another plant. But what you may not know about pollen is that there's a relationship between the way that that pollen is transported and the characteristics or appearance of the flowers of that plant. And if you think about it, it makes sense. You see, those plants that primarily transport pollen through the wind, they're not really all that impressive. But those plants that require and rely on animals or other organisms to take the pollen from one plant to another often are a lot more appealing. They smell better, they taste better, and they look better. You see, it's all a sales pitch to try and attract these pollinating organisms to come and acquire the pollen, either directly or indirectly, and move it to another plant. So we can further subdivide these plants that produce these enclosed seeds into monocots and dicots. And that just refers to, as the seed is developing, whether it has one or two cotyledons. Now, it doesn't make a huge difference when you first see this as the seed, but it does make a huge developmental difference because the pattern of things or the observable characteristics of the stems and the leaves and the root systems and even the flower patterns is very different between the monocots and the dicots. So the diversity of these angiosperms is huge. They range from the smallest of grasses to the tallest of trees and everywhere in between. They are, in short, some of the most successful living organisms that we have classified right now. So my hope is, after watching this video, that you can link the process of succession occurring in a parking lot to the increasing complexity that we can observe in the different domains of life in the plant kingdom. In our parking lot, we would first have the bryophytes, the mosses, appearing in those tiny cracks and maybe expanding them. And as they die, producing more and more organic matter that could eventually feed some more complex plants. So our first tracheophytes, our first vascular plants, the pteridophytes, the ferns. And then eventually we start to build up more and more organic matter and we can get plants that have deeper and more complex root systems. But first, they'd be shallower root systems, like we would see with the gymnosperms, those conifers. And then after many, many years, we would eventually start to get the bigger root systems for the bigger trees, our leaf-bearing, deciduous, giant trees. And we would see this process of succession occurring from our pioneer organisms all the way up into our climax community with these massive oaks and other deciduous leaf-bearing trees. And I want you to think about that process and relate it to the different groupings that we have with these plants. But I also want you to understand that this video is just the tip of the iceberg. The plant kingdom is incredibly diverse, and we've only just touched on the categorization of them. So, while I didn't set out to make you a botanist, or a horticulturalist, or a vegetarian, or even an above average gardener. My hope is after watching this that you can do a little bit more research on your own and appreciate the wide array and variety and uniqueness of a lot of these plants that we have come to rely on, not only for our food, not only for our clothes, not only for our transportation, be it the fuel or the plastics that make up the cars from the petroleum that was plants many, 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 many years ago, but also to appreciate the fact that for the most part, we just like to enjoy plants, whether we're walking through our garden, or through a forest, or receiving them as a gift, or even giving one to a friend. Thanks for watching.